Okay, welcome back. The topic this week is to give first a quick repetition of what we did with full configuration interaction theory. And then we are going to uh, jump into what we might call the first approximative money body. So last week, uh, what we discussed was a little bit about the basic philosophy of uh, full configuration interaction theory, which essentially means that uh, we have a money body basis. This is our computational basis. And uh, if we have such a basis, what we do then is to compute money body matrix elements. And that gives us what we call the money body Hamiltonian. And if we can diagonalize, diagonalize this matrix, so-called Hamiltonian matrix, then we have all the eigenpairs, eigenvalues and eigenstates. And then essentially we have solved the problem. And the way you would solve this is by standard diagonalization techniques, which entail a, a unitary or orthogonal, a set of unitary or orthogonal transformations. And one of the standard methods is uh, Jacobi rotations. Uh, you can transform these matrices into tridiagonal matrices because these are symmetric and emission matrices. And the uh, you can uh, then, uh, if you do a, a tridiagonal transformation, you can find the eigenvalues in an easier way because the matrix is tridiagonal. And you have uh, methods like Gibbons rotations, uh, which is one of the standard methods for getting the eigenvalues. Uh, if you have huge matrices, you can use iterative uh, eigenvalue solvers like uh, krulov based uh, methods, and one of them for symmetric matrices is called Langsus method. So this is typical if you end up with matrices of dimensionalities up to a billion or ten billions, which is state-of-the-art calculations nowadays. However, uh, this means that you um, either have a problem which is well defined by a finite input space, or you have the truncated in the space, and then you leave something out. Now, we are going to use this FCI calculations as a kind of a benchmark for money calculations we, uh, we are doing. Aye. And uh, you probably see the uh, so-called Lipkin model. And the Lipkin model is a model which we are going to practice a little bit uh, this week as well. And if you look into the exercises we have for this week, <laughs> the idea is also to use these exercises uh, Next week. So if you take a quick look into the exercises for this week and next week, <coughs> what you will see then is that uh, we are going to go through uh, the, the final stages of this uh, model. And uh, one thing is something which we discussed partly last week. And we actually set up the Hamiltonian matrix. And then I simply want you to uh, diagonalize that matrix convince yourself that the matrix you get using the quasar spin operators is the matrix which I put up uh, in in during the lectures last week. And I'm just coming back to where you find uh, the uh, lecture notes or the handwritten notes from last week. And you see that matrix at the end of the lectures. So I actually want you to take a look at that because it conveys a lot of the essential messages in an FCI calculation. And you will then see that if the... Uh, Matrix uh, elements, in this specific case, we have constant elements. So in general, this V is not a constant. It is state dependent, but this is a simplified Hamiltonian. And uh, the first part promotes what we call one particle, one role excitations around the chosen Fermi level. And the second one creates two particle, two role excitations. And by that way, you can set up a Hamiltonian matrix and then you plug in the values. You will then see that uh, in this specific case, the uh, lowest lying state is actually pretty close to the energy you would get with just the adding the single particle energies, which has a factor of a half. So you get four or minus four actually. And then uh, if you uh, make the interaction stronger, what happens then is that you get uh, uh, eigenstates which have a strong mixture with, uh, within your computational basis. So that's the, uh, the the main message here is that depending on the strength of the interaction which you have, then your computational basis, which in this case is a, a linear combination of slate and terminals, it leads up to that, the final state. So the computational basis is just a set of slate determinants, 
or configurations, which we might call them. Uh, in this first case, you would find that the configuration which you make as an ansatz for the ground state is pretty close to the final exact mountain dimensions. Whereas in the other case, you will see a strong mixture. And that tells you that the computational basis, uh, in case you were to increase it, you may actually need many, many more states. So if the interaction is typically strong uh, and you've chosen a specific computational basis, then uh, you may actually have to include a very large single particle basis, which then defines your many body basis. The next step is a way to prepare for the uh, ultrafog calculations. And we are going into many of these details uh, today and tomorrow. And uh, with the new basis, which you see here, and you can easily convince yourself uh, via unitized transformation here, this is essentially what we are doing. So we are in a way transforming the uh, creation and annihilation operators. Let me just switch up this one so we don't hear that pings all the time. And then uh, we are going to construct a new basis and we are going to use that one uh, to calculate or perform a hard for calculation. And next week, we are going to study something which is called the stability of the hard for equations. And we are going to use that in order to see that uh, in order uh, for the uh, hard for solution to represent a minimum, there is a constraint on the uh, single particle energies with respect to the interactions. So it's not given that you can run a hard for calculation. <coughs> so that was the uh, a little bit about the uh, the uh, notes which show I mean the exercises and I thought we could actually deal with this both this week and next week and then uh, when it comes to this uh, first take home exam since many of you probably have take home exams this week and next week I thought of waiting with the take home exam for the week which begins with October the 17th would that fit with your schedules? I mean, do you have any conflicts with projects or things like that? Uh, uh, how if you would estimate the workload? Is you it's one week for another take yeah. exam? So this is uh, no report. It's actually answer questions uh, with the, you can just hand in a handwritten uh, answer. So right. it's just a typical take home exam. And it's not like physics for 110. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like that. But what about the possible uh, gold parts? So in, this is also something. To, so what, what I'm going to present is a, is a project where you could actually set up a half refox solver. Mm -hmm. And we give you bits and pieces so you can actually uh, see how you can set it up. Uh, and you will also get the matrix elements. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're interested, we can have a coding part as well, if that is of interest. If not, we can just have a plain paper and pencil exercise. I'll like the coding part. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to put in a coding part. But the, you will get uh, elements of code. So it will involve you writing out a book. But it's going to be a uh, something which rotates around SCI calculations and hard reform calculations. So it means that, the, and as you will see today, hard reform represents a specific unitary transformation of your SCI calculations. And that's something which we're going to see pretty soon. So one thing which I uh, also wanted to remind you quickly is that the if you go back, this is this is about the exercises. So the handwritten note. If you go to the handwritten notes and look at the notes from uh, from last week, which is September thirtieth, uh, for the exercise which we have this week, if you scroll down, uh, you will see that I. Now this shouldn't be a uh, more pain, sorry. I, I, yeah, this actually, it doesn't give you everything yeah. when you display it with uh, with GitHub. Now at the end, uh, what I did was to present the, the answer, which you will get when you uh, uh, set up the Hamiltonian matrix for this four particle case. So the four particle case has a maximum angular momentum, which is J equal to two. And it has, so it's actually J equal to two angular momentum case. And it has spin projections of minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, and two. And that gives a five by five matrix. And the Hamiltonian matrix, which we discussed 
uh, last week. I, I went a little bit quickly through things, but I want you to actually go through the details. Now, the, the model here allows us to, to gain this kind of uh, insight about the relations between a computational basis and the strength of the interactions. And then uh, we can also use the Lipke model to uh, run a simpler Hartree Fock calculations. Actually, this is one of the cases where we can get analytical answers for the Hartree Fock calculations. And that gives the model is semi realistic. It's a small uh, case. I mean, a five by five matrix is normally what we call a baby case, really a baby case. And uh, it's quickly, it's pretty quick to diagonalize and get the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So this is basically where you find the uh, the uh, the input you need for the exercises this week. And my hope is that you could play around a little bit with the Hamiltonian matrix and just gain this kind of uh, uh, understanding of the strength of the interaction and how that translates into the mixing of states from your computational basis. Then, uh, so the topic this week is to get started with a, a libertatory fog theory. So what I wanted now is just to skim through things, some of the things using slides. And I hope you can forgive me for that because I just wanted to give you some of the, uh, the basic motivation. And then we are going to go back to uh, paper and pencil on the whiteboard here. Uh, basically, uh, most of the things which I'm going to cover, uh, you can actually read about that in the chapter three of the Sartre Maslow. And uh, in particular, chapter three, one to three, four is uh, the, uh, the relevant chapters. Now, what we are going to do now is the following. So we are going to redefine uh, define a new single particle basis, which now, if you think of this in this, in uh, the standard uh, first quantization, as we've been uh, calling it, where we have this dependence on the spatial degrees of freedom as well. What we're going to introduce is a new operator, H Hartree Fock. And by using the variational uh, theory, we are going to find that this uh, new Hamiltonian is actually something which we can define in terms of this matrix F, as we call it, we left this unspecified previously, but it's given by your kinetic energy plus the uh, external potential, which the particles move in, plus a term here, which modifies the motion of a specific single particle state due to the presence of the other particles. Because here we are summing over all the single particle states below the Fermi level. And you see now that if P here is equal to a state below the Fermi level, due to the fact that we have anti-symmetrized matrix element, that contribution is zero. Because if P is equal to I and Q is equal to I, then you get uh, two matrix elements, the direct term minus the exchange term, which cancel each other exactly. So in that specific case, uh, you will get a zero contribution. Else, you get a contribution which now is set up by all the single particle degrees of freedom below the Fermi level. And that is something you can think of. A particle which moves in a field, this could be a harmonic oscillator. Or, as the, there was an ambitious, an ambitious example in Graham Wobbler, where they confine neutrons to move in a small area governed by the gravitational force. So you're not limited. That was actually a pretty neat thing. It's a beautiful experiment. And the, the gravitational force uh, looks very much like the Coulomb interaction. And these neutrons will interact with a strong force, but which uh, has a very short range. So you could actually model the motion of these neutrons under a gravitational force. In our case, we have a, there's an experiment which was run in, I think, 2000, 2001. It's pretty neat. Uh, but the, this could be a harmonic oscillator. It could be a uh, potential which is set up by the uh, atomic nucleus in an, in an atom. And then we would have the interaction between individual electrons for that case. And this is going to lead to a set of equations which we can solve. So this u Hartree fock is now going to be identified with this term. And these are the equations which we are going to derive. And then later we can link this with a full configuration to actual theory. And we are going to see that the Hartree fock uh, equations 
correspond to us zeroing out a block in the full Hamiltonian matrix. And that's also a pretty neat connection. Now, one of the things I wanted to remind you of, so this is kind of overarching issue. And if the Hartree-Fock method converges, and we have stability criteria for that, which we're going to derive, if the method converges, what it guarantees is that this Hartree-Fock energy is going to be larger or equal to the exact energy. And it's normally less than the, or equal to what we call the reference energy, which was then computed with the kinetic energy plus the external potential and just the potential itself with a given basis without changing the basis. Now, one thing I want to take the liberty a little bit about is to, uh, uh, because I'm not going to go uh, through variational calculus, because I assume that many of you have seen that before. Is there anyone who's never seen variational calculus before? That's a kind of uh, almost standard now in basically all in some of the basic mathematics courses. So in, in, in general, what we are dealing with is a, an integral. So in our case, it's the energy as a function of a slater determinant. And uh, what we typically have then is a function here, which we want to optimize. And we have a path from A to B. And you know that from classical mechanics, if you have a conservative force, the path from A to B, the final result is independent of the way you take between A and B. That's the kind of basis for the work energy theory with conservative forces. I guess that brings a kind of back, right? And you can you can prove that if you have a conservative force, that uh, then the uh, the way you go from A to B, uh, and the final result is actually independent of the way you go from A to B. So in, in this specific case, you would have the, uh, uh, the wave function, and then you have the derivative of the wave function. And if you look at your uh, Schrodinger equation for the expectation value of the energy, that can actually, with a small manipulation, you can rewrite the second derivative as a product of two first derivative, first order derivatives. So that means that uh, your energy expression and the Schrodinger equation can then be written out in terms of this function of uh, the wave function and the derivative of the wave function. So that's the basis. And then you want now to find uh, the path from A to B, which optimizes this quantity. So that means that you're going to look at the uh, uh, variational derivative delta E here. So if you look at the uh, calculation of the energy expectation value, and what I've done here is to assume that these wave functions psi are normalized, because else I would have to include a denominator with a normalization factor. So now I simply assume that these functions are already normalized. You can always assume that. And then, uh, but we're coming back to that when we're setting up the equations as well. And then uh, what you can do then is that you have a constraint here that this has to be normalized to one. So that's a typical constraint. And this, this is routinely what you would calculate if you, um, if somebody gives you a trial wave function and you do a Monte Carlo calculation, is essentially what you do then, uh, since that would be a multi-dimensional function, is to evaluate that stochastically. And then you have some trial wave function, which may not be the eigenstate of H. Then if we now take the simple uh, Hamiltonian here, which is just the uh, kinetic energy plus the potential energy, and I just replace this with V here, just for simplicity, then we know that uh, uh, the, this quantity here, if we now take the limits A go to minus infinity and B to plus infinity, we know that this quantity here, when we do the, uh, the uh, integration by parts, is given by the wave function times the derivative. And then I have a term which now depends on the two derivatives. So if you look back at the starting point here, you have something which will now depend on the derivative of the wave function. And so this is just a trick which we use to rewrite the kinetic energy part. And when you insert the limits, uh, the assumption then is that the wave function is zero in these units. And then uh, what you would do next is to uh, uh, set up 
this uh, into the variation here and, and add a constraint, which is then given by what's normally called Lagrangian multipliers, because these equations here, since they have a constraint, that means that x, y, and z are not independent of each other. So one of them, will, since you have a constraint, the normalization constraint here, or that is given by constant, then uh, you have to use this trick of adding the so-called Lagrange multipliers. So I'm assuming in a way that you have seen these things before. And this is a standard trick in optimization theory. And for those of you taking the machine learning course, you're actually going to encounter a Lagrangian optimization problem, which leads to something that's called support vector machines. So in, instead of a standard uh, optimization problem, as you see now with a cost function, you can add a Lagrangian multiplier, and then you have a, another technique, which is called support vector machines. That's another way of looking at the optimization. And then you can calculate the, uh, you plug this in, and uh, we you have the final variational uh, equation, which now has the kinetic energy, and then you take the potential energy. And the thing is that now uh, the two parts here may not be fully independent, but you can make them independent. So you can actually look at an equation for uh, psi complex conjugate and psi. So you can separate them out. And if you look at the equation for psi complex conjugate, then you use the Euler-Lagrange equations. And then you get an equation now of motion so the order Lagrange equation, if you take the energy and the potential energy in classical mechanics, when you use these equations, you get Newton's equations of motion. So here, starting with a quantum mechanical energy, what you end up with is actually Schrodinger's equation, which is our equation of motion in this case. So this is a very beautiful way, and that is why the variational uh, formalism is so powerful, because you can actually derive the equations of motion starting from the energy. So this applies, obviously, if you have energy conserving forces. If you don't have that, then the whole assumption with this being independent of the path breaks down. And I guess in mathematics courses, actually in the first courses in calculus and, and analysis, you see typically the derivation of this, uh, the constancy using of, of line integrals with uh, uh, of path if you have a so-called uh, energy conserving force, where the force is actually the gradient of the potential. I guess you may have seen something like that. So this is, uh, I just meant this is a kind of uh, uh, reminder of uh, what we are going to use. So we are actually going to set up a functional, and now the functional is going to be a functional of the uh, Slater determinant we have for the ground state answers. So that's going to be, so if here we're going to put in this phi zero for the vacuum state, which we have assumed, the new vacuum state. And with that one, we are then going to repeat this exercise. And we're going first to look at the equations in coordinate space, which actually lead to a, a set of equations which we normally don't recommend to solve numerically. And you will see why. And later, we are going to look at the equations using a uh, way ba function basis expansion. So that means that we're actually going to have a wave function which is going to be a linear expansion in terms of the computational basis. And then the only thing we will need to vary are the coefficients. But what we're going to see now is that these equations are going to lead to a, an optimization problem where this u hartree is now given by this specific term here. And the new single particle basis, which we're going to use, is going to define a new reference energy, which normally is better than the one we had previously. Hopefully better. In the sense that the uh, energy you get is lower than the energy you get with the previous reference basis. Okay, so this was a kind of uh, uh, long, long uh, uh, round to uh, give you the basic motivation of what is coming. And now we're going to derive the equations, both in, in the coordinate space and the equations using a, a uh, expansion in terms of coefficients. And when we look at this expansion in terms of coefficients, there is a set of equations down here, which I wanted to re remind you of. So after we've gone through this, and that's how you can actually rewrite the Slater determinants 
So there's actually a simple uh, way to rewrite the Slater determinants in one basis with respect to the one in another basis. And this means that the Slater determinants you get by using your computational basis and you make an index function in terms of that, they will also be useful. And you've seen that in some of the exercises. Okay, so I'm going to go back to my uh, uh, whiteboard here. And then we're going to, any questions, by the way, before we switch to the whiteboard? So I, I spent some time on just giving you the, uh, the kind of rationale for what we are going to do now. Yes, bring up my notes here. <clears throat> so in the Fock theory. So then this is our first approximative method. So what, as I said, what we're now going to define is a, a new one-body Hamiltonian, which is going to be given by what we are defined as a kinetic energy, I equal one up to the number of particles. And then we had minus delta I divided by two M. And then we are putting H bar and C, et cetera, equal to one. And then we have an external potential this is i equal one up to the number of particles. We have a u external, and that depends on the positions x or i. And then we have a term, which now is given by the all the states below the Fermi level. And this is going now to be given by a, an operator, which I'm going to call a, a j, a u out of up here. And we haven't specified what it looks like. So what this is going to give us now, when we want to relate, so just anticipate what is coming now. So the relation, relation to FCI. So when we set up FCI theory, just let me remind you of the way the Hamiltonian matrix looks like. So. One thing is that we had these matrix elements, which were given by a Slater determinant from the computational basis. And that could be a one particle, one hole, it could be a zero particle, zero hole, two particle, two hole, etc. And this is given by this specific transition matrix element between two states. And then we could set up a Hamiltonian matrix where we now had all these different states and we labeled them in terms of zero particle, zero hole, one particle, one hole, two particle, two hole, etc. up to n particle, n hole, excitations. So we have these blocks of matrix elements. And then we had here on, on the, what we can call the brass side, two particle, two hole, and all the way down to n particle, n hole. And in case we had a two body matrix element, in our two-body interaction, then we found that the matrix elements beyond having two single particle states which are different are equal to zero because we have a two-body interaction. And we found a structure like this, zero, and then zero, and this went like this, and then we have zeros. And so we got this kind of band diagonal matrix here. Now, uh, what we could do is that we could discard, so we can make an approximation to full FCI. And this full, this approximation, and actually you will find such approximations to full CI, and this is just called configuration interaction theory. So what you could do now is just to keep zero particle, zero hole, and one particle, one whole matrix elements. There's nothing which hinders you doing that. You could be more ambitious. You could include two particle, two whole. So that's a truncated FCI calculation. And since these are called, these are normally called single excitations, 
because you excite a single state below the Fermi level. So these are called single excitations. And you will see this as uh, something which is called CIS. That means configuration interactions with single excitations only. So this is CI with singles. Now what you could do now, you could be a little bit more ambitious. You could keep zero particle, zero hole, one particle, one hole, and two particle to hole. And these are normally called double excitations because you have two particles and two holes. So these are called, just in jargon, doubles. And you can continue like this. So what happens then is that you're actually deleting out degrees of freedom. That means that your Hamiltonian matrix will contain zero particle, zero hole, one particle, one hole, and two particle, two hole. And the thing is that this actually generates some problems, which we'll come back to later. So you could have a matrix which is much smaller now. Or if you take the one particle, one hole only, then your matrix will just have these two blocks the uh, non diagonal ones and the diagonal ones. So, and the, the non diagonal ones are seem to be the mission, so they are the same. And what we found when we calculated the uh, transition matrix elements is that we had nice expressions for these quantities. Now, uh, and let me quickly remind you about that. So this is normally called CISD, configuration interaction with singles and doubles, and that's a truncation which is very much used in quantum chemistry. It leads to problems with uh, some uh, poorly violating contributions, which we may come back to, but it uh, serves as a kind of approximation. You're just making a truncate. So you can truncate in the single particle basis. So remember now again that the single particle basis which you have here, these and the which define these states, these many body states, in principle is an infinite single particle basis. But we make a truncation. So we actually have truncated already the basis here. And then instead of looking at all possible many body excitations, we limit the excitations to a specific class. Because if you have a two-body interaction, what you will often see is that the two-body interaction is the one which dominates. And that leads to dominating two particle two hole and one particle one hole contributions. But let's now see the um, uh, this is the part of the overarching features. Let's now go back to CIS. So that means that we have a block with a zero particle, zero hole. So I'm going a little bit into detail here because this is going to be parts of the take home midterm. So you will see the same thing again. And we're going to practice a little bit with that. So we have a dense matrix here. And we have matrix elements. If we look at the, we know the, the zero particle, zero hole. We have calculated that one of phi zero. And that's something which we call the E zero reference, right? And we know what that looks like. We also have, if we look at the matrix elements, which link the two blocks. So we have a zero a phi zero with a one particle, one hole excitation, which we label as a phi i of a. We found that this one was actually equal to that matrix elements i, f, a, which again was equal to the matrix elements of the unperturbed Hamiltonian, as we called it. So this contains just kinetic energies plus external potential, plus a term which is given by all the states below the Fermi level. And then we have an ij of v, and then we have an a of j, and this is an anti-symmetrized matrix element. So these matrix elements have an analytical expression. And then we found also the matrix elements for the diagonal pieces uh, for the next block, I mean this block here. Uh, I'm not going to repeat them, but we can simply state that here you have a set of matrix elements which are typically non-zero. And the diagonal ones have the reference energy plus the difference between this uh, i, i 
and AA. Now, what you can do now, suppose this is your Hamiltonian matrix. So let's just write it like this. What you would do now is to find a, a unitary transformation where you have U of A times like this. And that gives us a diagonal matrix, which then contains the two eigenvalues. So that would be lambda one, lambda two, and zero, and zero. Now, the unitary transformation which we get when we do hartree fock theory is actually pretty interesting. So normally it is unitary transformation. So remember now again that you have these blocks uh, are not given by just one matrix element, but they can be many matrix elements. So what we are going to see now is that by requiring that I of F of A <laughs> is equal to zero, <laughs> represents a unitary transformation. And this is what we're going to impose as a solution for the Hartree fock equation. So this is what we're going to do right now. So this is the solution of Hartree fock equations, of uh, HF equations. Give this specific result. So you can think of the uh, Hartree fock uh, the Hartree Fock method as a specific unitary transformation where you zero out a specific block of your Hamiltonian matrix. And here we have made an approximation to the full configuration interaction theory. And you will often see that uh, being replaced by the acronym FCI, which is CI. So full CI means that we take into account all possible ways we can distribute the particles among the single particle sets. And then you get all the configurations. But then you can start truncating. But you could actually do the Hartree Fock uh, calculation on the full matrix. And you can still zero out those matrix elements. And that means that what you would get then with Hartree Fock theory is that these would be zero. So for the full case, you can still think of Hartree Fock theory as a specific unitary transformation, which does not give you a diagonal matrix but where you zero out specific blocks of your Hamiltonian matrix. Uh, I guess you don't see all the details before we have derived the equations, but I want to give you the kind of overarching message and how you can understand Hartree Fock theory, which is an approximation to the Einstein problem, in terms of uh, linear algebra and unitary transformations. So I mentioned last week that all so essentially, all the wave function based methods, what they try to is to zero out some of these blocks in a consistent or less consistent way. Many body perturbation theory is less consistent because you don't know whether it converges or not. Whereas copper cluster theory sums to infinite order set to correlations. And copper cluster theory is actually a method which zeroes out this term and this term. But you can continue and zero out all the other terms. But then we are back to the full CI calculations. So everything we are going to do now can be interpreted as a kind of approximation to the full diagonalization problem. So this is a kind of more overarching view which I want you to have me with before we now start diving into the details. But I kind of don't see what we gain by setting those to zero now? So the big gain, if you look at this problem here, this is a huge problem. So you're solving a much smaller problem instead of solving the full diagonalization case. Yeah, but haven't we already reduced the size by selecting those four matrix elements? But still, these matrix elements can be infinitely many. Oh, OK. So even the one particle, one whole block can have a huge set of matrix elements. Yeah. So even diagonalizing that one can be a heavy job. Whereas the Hartree Fock equation is just reduced to, so if you have, a, uh, just to give you an example here, uh, if you have, a, a, let's say, 100 single particle states, you will get a 100 by 100 matrix, which you need to diagonalize in order to get the Hartree Fock single particle states. But if you have, uh, let's say, from this 100 
single particle say suppose you can make 10,000 one particle one whole configurations you end up with having to diagonalize at 10,000 by 10,000 matrix and that's a much bigger problem than the smaller one of diagonalizing 100 by 100 matrix so Hartley Fock theory gives you a problem where you have translated a mind body problem into a set of coupled single particle equations so that's the benefit here. So let's say it's a simpler, it's an approximation to the problem. What we did here, CIS, is also an approximation to, uh, to the full problem. But with Hartree Fock theory, what we do now is that we get these matrix elements automatically equal to zero. And we know how to calculate with that basis, we know how to calculate the diagonal matrix elements here. But we're going to see the, the, the details now when we when we move on here. So the first topic which we're going to look at is the traditional one, which you will see in most textbooks, which leads to a numerically inefficient uh, method. And then we're going to look at the uh, variation of the coefficients. So first we're going to vary the single particle wave functions, and that's going to give us equations in the coordinate space where we have to evaluate the integrals with the expectation value of the kinetic energy and the expectation value of the potential energy. And then we are going to change this to a variation of coefficients. So there are two ways by which we're going to do that. So that is normally what we call a, a coordinate space approximation. This is the first we're going to look at, coordinate space Hartree fock And then is variation of coefficients. So in the first case, we're going to vary the single particle wave functions. In the second case, we are going to vary the uh, coefficients of the wave function when we have a linear expansion in terms of an orthogonal basis, which is our computational basis. So let's look at the first case here. So the coordinate space Hartree Fock, because that's the one you will see in essentially all textbooks. And what we are going to do now is simply to vary the problem here, delta of phi zero. So we are going to vary the wave function and we want to minimize this quantity here. And we want that one to be zero. So what we're going to do then, since this is a product of single particle wave functions, we need them to vary each single particle wave function. I see now that we are past the hour, so I think it's okay to take a small break, right? And I put the report.